Howdy, 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 all you cool cats and kittens. Welcome back to another lonely day here on Anti-Tools Farm because Berkeley had to restart his computer because Steam crashed. So it's just me for now, but Berkeley will be here soon. Um, and I can't read any of your texts, any of the chat, because I still haven't learned how to make it appear on my screen. So just you get to enjoy me monologuing to myself. But, uh, you know, let's be real here. I kind of do that anyways. So I guess that's life. But uh, that also means I have to do stuff I don't usually do. And that means you get to see stuff that you don't usually see, like the mushroom cave. Um, I don't know how many of you are interested in mycology. But there's a really great book about mushrooms called Entangled Life by a guy named Merlin Sheldrake, which is a very wizardy name. And there's several facets to the book, but uh, I think the kind of the overarching theme is just how strange mushrooms really are. They're really not quite like any other life out there. And there's all sorts of different creatures in the world but mushrooms are so varied and so strange and they can do some really, really interesting things um, that we don't understand yet. And it makes me happy that such a neat little organism uh, is kind of beyond our grasp. I guess I find it comforting that we don't know some things yet and that there's more to learn because... Uh, sometimes I feel like we've already learned everything and there's nothing left to discover and and just kind of the doomerism of modern society. But it doesn't have to be that way. Jared, we have streamed for about 45 hours and you waited for the minute for me to be gone to bring up my main man, Merlin Sheldrake. <laughs> I cannot believe this. <laughs> I didn't know this you is... liked Merlin Sheldrake. <laughs> I don't know anything about him other than he wrote that book and that his name is the best name ever given <laughs> to man or beast. <laughs> it is truly a great name. We will we will uh, agree on that. Um, Jared, I think something is wrong. I don't think OBS is picking up Discord. Looks Ooh. like... Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, let's see what we can do about that. Let's hop over to this guy. Hey, there you are. Can you, um, can um you yeah, it looked like that works. See yourself. Excellent. All right. Hey guys, Berkeley's here. Hey, I decided to join and also my steam decided to start. So I guess, I guess that's good. That is good. Megan in the chat says, looks great. Thanks. Sam, if you question why I'm digging in the trash one more time, I'm going to throw your phone in the river. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> That's okay. I'll bring fresh fruit around later to make up for it. Berkeley, we're living in a world where politicians seem to be becoming more and more uh, exaggerated caricatures of themselves. But Stardew Valley isn't quite that way. Mayor Lewis seems like a pretty unassuming guy. What? He, he's making a golden statue of himself. <laughs> <laughs> okay, relative to the crazy things politicians are doing, IRL, I don't know if that actually qualifies as that crazy. Oh, man, you're right. Huh. I, well, depending on how much gold costs in this society, but based on how much we've been able to attain, not uh, probably not too much. No. And you know what? He's supporting local business, right? That's Clint. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but, but I have to ask the question, who is Mayor Lewis's successor? If he were to die or abdicate the throne, who do you picture stepping in and why? Okay, yeah, you brought this up before the chat and I've got or before the stream and I've got some thoughts, but first I want to hear what the chat has to say. Chat. If who, so let's Oh go ahead. 
Who gets to rule Stardew Valley if Mayor Lewis were to be poisoned? Do we want to go the murder route or do we want to make it broader? I mean, all my homies hate Mayor Lewis. We'll put it that way. Okay. Berkeley, I think something's wrong with me. I just went to try to sell this coral to the trash can, which okay. doesn't work. I did just get a fish taco out of that one, though. Hmm. Wow. Okay, good thoughts from Megan in the chat. Uh, the player would make a great mayor, of course. Um, or Marnie, she's devious. Babarma says Leah turns Stardew Valley into a hippie commune. Heck yes, that's the sequel we all want. I, I hope. I hope you meant that in a positive way. <laughs> It does feel like that's actually not a too far-fetched of an outcome, right? Mm. Like the the game focuses a lot on cottage industry and community cooperation. Um, so I feel like you could make that step pretty easily. Yeah. Berkeley, is it okay if I use some bombs to free our dog? Yeah, that would be... That would be a great thing to do. They've been trapped up here for a little bit now. Okay, do you mind if I go buy some more copper and iron? Go ahead. You're, you're low on both. All right, so I've got a few different scenarios. One, peaceful transfer of power. There's an election. They keep up with the status quo. And uh, Pierre wins. Mm. I, I think he's like he's got the ambition and the the love of the town. Uh, that you'd need to win that election. Um, okay, but Barman says probably the door for Krobus would feel more like the current USA. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I just missed Clint by one minute or, or 10 minutes, I guess, since they go in 10 minute increments. Blow up his door. I'll not be, <laughs> I'll not be buying iron or copper today. Okay, so that's scenario one peaceful transfer power. We're going Pierre. Okay. Um, Number two, there's a coup. Uh, <laughs> might makes right, someone steps in and takes over the town. Now, this could go one of two ways. Um, I think uh, the wizard, Rasmodius, is that his name? Yeah. I'm getting him mixed up with Asimondius, but that's something else. <laughs> Rasmodius, the wizard, he decides to become like a necromancer king and just like... Uh, Stardew Valley becomes Mordor, basically. Wow. That's that hardcore. One possibility. <laughs> <laughs> Number two, Kent with his military training. Uh, he, he doesn't do it alone. He like gets a pack of people together and they take over the town. That's maybe not the, the happiest ending. Um, yeah, what, what other options are there? I, I gotta ask... What do you think life would look like under Kent? Because he seems like he's a pretty... I don't know. I haven't actually interacted him with that with him that much, but he seems decent. Yeah. Um, I think that just uh, Jody's chores would get split up between the rest of the town. Kent's not going to help her out, unfortunately, but uh, he'll get he'll get everyone else on board. Hmm. Is is there beef there? Uh, it just seems like Jody is always tired and doing so many things for her two sons, and uh, her sons and husband don't help out enough, in my opinion. Uh -huh. Um, if if you don't have like solidifying power like those scenarios, and you're instead distributing power, I feel like I like the Leah and the hippie commune. Um. Kent is the embodiment of weaponized incompetence. Oof. Emphasis on weaponized. <laughs> Kent sent bombs to Scamble 3 in the mail. That was one of my backup plans if we weren't able to like find Jade or uh or Quartz. Um if you remember there were there's a long time where we were just waiting on a Jade or a Quartz so that we could get our first bomb from the Desert Trader. Mm-hmm. Um 
yeah, backup plan was to either marry Abigail or befriend Kent and get them to gift us bombs. What do you think, Jared? What's the future without Mary Lewis? Ah, man. Okay, well, pre-downfall of Joe Jamar, let's say you haven't completed the community center. Mm. I definitely think that whoever that weird guy in the suit Morris. Was, Morris, thank you. I think he would definitely be the guy to step in. And it would not be a trend like a, a democratic transition. Mm -hmm. um, it might appear that way, but he would definitely rig it. Yeah, um, for sure. And then I feel like what he would do though is he would probably bulldoze the town. He'd like buy everybody's houses, bulldoze the town, and then turn it into like a parking garage or something. Yeah. <laughs> like i want to call it extreme gentrification but maybe it's just it's beyond that i'm just imagining like the the uh villain from uh oh, what is it called it's a wonderful life is that the the christmas movie with uh the guy who talked like this mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah i'm picturing the old banker guy from uh, it's a wonderful life okay um i was picturing uh the the antagonist from meet the robinsons <laughs> <It's> <laughs> the different scenario, but <laughs> also possible with the judge mark takeover <laughs> yeah that's a good point um another <laughs> so there's some theories that maybe linus is way more rich and or powerful and or important um than he seems i would love for mayor lewis to die and for him to reveal for linus to reveal that he he is mr stardew himself or something like that <laughs> and uh, just take his rightful place um maybe he's the heir of a sealed door yes we don't know he brings the sword that was broken mm -hmm. out and cuts off morris's hand and oh well that would be a sealed door sorry we're talking aragorn I could yeah. see that. The Strider parallel. I could see that. Uh -huh. um, Megan wants you to put some respect on Jimmy Stewart's name, please. Thank Jared. you. He. I wrote a report about him. He, he was one of my favorite actors growing up, but I just have not thought about him in a long time. Yeah, you wouldn't think that, by the way. You didn't know his name just now. All um, right. That was that, that was a prime. That was like <laughs> Wagyu grade roast that you just <laughs> dumped on me. <laughs> Oh shoot, it's twelve. Um yeah, any other theories? Or um not theories, I guess. Well, I mean if if force is required, you gotta take into account the adventurers guild, because those dudes they might be old, but they've got mm -hmm. the hardware. So Yeah. Maybe Kent takes over temporarily and then they come and like liberate the people. Yeah. Sorry, I don't want to make Kent sound like a villain. I like him. But in this scenario, he has led a military coup. Yep. Okay, chat. I want to hear your votes. Who, Which which of those futures would you want to live in? Linus takes the throne of, as rightful heir of a sealed door. Um, Jojo Mert turns everything into a parking lot. I am not selling these well. I want to... <laughs> <laughs> hippie commune pierre wins the election or rasmodius turns into mordor wow i didn't even realize i had two lord of the rings references in there <laughs> megan's here for the linus uprising good choice jared what, what would you want oh man Okay, so I have to say part of me wants to see a, a parking garage big enough to fill the whole valley just because that's an engineering marvel. <laughs> <laughs> but but I, if I had to marvel live if it there, like stays good, right? True, true. <laughs> Anyone with enough money can pave a city. Come on, we've all done that. <laughs> It has to be like the dwarven ruins from Skyrim, perfectly preserved. Um, I think, 
realistically, the one I'd like to live in is probably Linus. I think he's he's probably the most live and let live of the valley. You know, he's not... He would just let people be themselves, and I like that. And he probably wouldn't build a golden statue of himself either. Probably not. So, there's that. Bobarma says Linus poses for campaign photo shoot in home knitted mittens. <laughs> he's got my vote. He's he's the Bernie of Stardew. Uh, wait, what should I do today? Oh, I should go buy that copper and iron that I was talking about. Um, just update on what I'm working on. I'm still just uh, trying to get as many ingredients as possible for more kegs and preserves jars so mm. that we can scale up that money making in the shed. Yep. We're we're approaching 200,000 doubloons. We sure are. Um, I So I was checking the wiki this morning. And by this morning, I mean a half hour ago. I don't. Why did I say morning? <laughs> um. Anyway. Uh. So. A pig with full hearts, with the farmer, gets an average of three truffles per day, assuming the weather's good and it's not winter. And if we get that level ten foraging, so that every truffle is iridium quality then those are over a thousand gold a day. I think it's 12,000 gold per truffle. So each pig will get us an average of almost 4,000 per good weather day. Oh, did you mean 1,200 gold per truffle? 1,200 gold. Did okay. I say 12,000? You did, and I was a little bit confused. Um, no, 1,200. Okay. <laughs> so if we get um, yeah, 10, 10 pigs, which we have money and barn space for, so I think we should do it. We'll be we'll be getting about like thirty five thousand to forty thousand gold per day just from truffles. So that's exciting. That is exciting. That's that's uh you know really really wealthy <laughs> salary. Mm -hmm. I, I can hardly imagine what it would be like to have that kind of income. Berkeley, I just checked the hidden bundle and yeah. two of the items on there are pretty achievable. They want dino mayonnaise and wine, silver star wine. Okay. Yeah. I will make some dino mayonnaise right now. I couldn't remember if we had donated that or not. Um, so silver star wine is a little bit harder. We need to upgrade our house until we get the basement. And then oh, put the wine okay. in a cask. I need to talk to Robin to upgrade the house. <laughs> Unless yeah. you want to continue with yours, which we did partially upgrade. Um, no, I think we should switch to yours. Okay. Uh, we'll probably need to buy some wood from her um, and take the wood and stone that we have in our chest if you want to upgrade the house. Okay. Um, let me just actually check what, what all you need to upgrade the house. While I'm doing that, uh, Jared, you said you've been playing Breath of the Wild. How's that going? Yeah, so the new game, Tears of the Kingdom, came out, and I'm enjoying it. But I, I have to say, I haven't played a whole lot, and I, I don't know if the chat's going to tolerate spoilers. But some of the interactions with the characters is really interesting to me because it's a world that by all rights should be pretty dark, but so far what I've run into has been pretty positive. And my favorite Zelda game of all time, uh, Twilight Princess, is kind of the same way where things are dark except that also the interactions with the people are kind of dark and uh i find that more immersive i i it just felt kind of jarring but i i feel like that's the modern theme on a lot of games is like things are in chaos but you know you should be hopeful which is 
a worthy theme and <laughs> good to emulate in your real life. Mm -hmm. um, but just hard to imagine, I guess, uh, huge calamities occurring and then people getting together and being like, oh, this, it's fine. It's okay. <laughs> I don't know. So I guess it just, I found it a little disorienting, but I'm really enjoying it so far. And I think I'm just, uh, I'm getting old. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad you're enjoying it. Um, I've got some bad news. Uh, in order to upgrade the house, so the next upgrade is achievable. We just need 150 or 450 wood and 10,000 gold. Yeah. Um, the upgrade after that requires 150 hardwood. <laughs> so I Boy. think we're going to need to wait until we've got some good old. Do we have uh, some growing in the desert? I think we do. Okay. I'm going to go try to get some more mahogany seeds right now. Okay. So I'm taking all the wood and stone we have right now. Okay. Um, you don't actually need the stone for the first upgrade. Okay. I'm putting back all the stone we have right now. Okay. And <laughs> I hate to say this, but I think it might be too late in the day now. It is. <laughs> I'm so sorry. That's okay. First thing tomorrow. IRL, I went grocery shopping at 9.30 last night. Ooh. So... It's How's just that? actually surprisingly pleasant. Um, I live in a small town, so there's pretty much two. And when I say pretty much, there's exactly two supermarkets. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of them is fairly small and a little pricey, but they carry good stuff. And the other one is Walmart. So uh we usually go to walmart because they have it's like a one-stop thing so we don't have to go to multiple places mm -hmm. and usually it's absolutely packed with college kids but at nine o'clock at night it's only moderately packed with college kids so that's an improvement i remember when i lived in a college town just the when there was like a long weekend or like thanksgiving break the day after the break was just the worst to be at walmart or any other grocery store yeah everybody everybody who you know was out of town or in town but enjoying their time off suddenly comes back to real life and has to take care of their delayed responsibilities Mm -hmm. primarily feeding themselves <laughs> all right we're gonna try to give a diamond to the woman with the green hair caroline and now we're gonna give some cherries to pierre who looks a little bit like one of the green brothers from a distance oh yeah i can see that but less the cool. One. The Hank, the Hank one. Thank you. I think one of my favorite. Oh, go ahead. No, <laughs> I want to hear about one of your favorite. Um, I love when the. So I'm a fan of John Green and Hank Green independently, and then also together. And I love when they talk about each other and their relationship. It's very funny. Um, and so Hank Green, it, he does a lot of things but one of the things he does is he, he like got a degree in environmental science and cares a lot about science he runs scishow if you've heard of that um anyway so he's known as the science brother mm -hmm. and at one point uh john was at some sort of slightly fancy party and met someone slightly famous who saw him and said oh you're one of the green brothers are you the science one or the other one <laughs> <laughs> oh boy what a way to be identified yeah that's i could see that as kind of flattering but also a little bit annoying i'm the best-selling author of looking for alaska and the fault in our stars also known as the other one <laughs> <sighs> so They've both written quite popular books, haven't they? 
It's, um, Hank has recently gotten into noveling, like in the last four or five years. It, not nearly as popular as John's, though. Um, I enjoyed them. They're some of my favorite books, but uh, they're not nearly as well known as John's. So it's so interesting to me that they both have had some professional success, though, in, in, in literature. Mm -hmm. Because... Like, what are the odds? Maybe, I guess, once you're well-connected, it's easier to find an editor and a publisher to work with somebody else you know who you know has some talent. But, you know, there's not, like, J.R.R. Tolkien's brother, if he had one, obviously didn't write, <laughs> write, like, Lord of the Rings-adjacent series that has very similar or some similar characteristics. Yeah, I, the Bronte sisters come to mind. Um, I have not read anything they've written, sadly. I need Emily to do that. Emily wrote um, Little Women, Heights. right? No, okay. I'm and sorry. Charlotte wrote uh, Jane Eyre. There you go. Um, and their third sister also wrote books. <laughs> <laughs> the other okay. one. Here's something cool about the Bronte sisters. Um, they they all wrote under pseudonyms at first because it was hard to get published as a female novelist at the time. Mm -hmm. um, so they had male pseudonyms, and their pseudonyms were also siblings. Uh, they all used the same name, same <laughs> last name. That's so, awesome. That's cute. Anyway, yeah, on like why Hank could be successful as an author when his brother also is. I think part of it is what you said, that he, he had the connections and the know-how and the industry ties. Um, but also, like, he's been a YouTuber professionally for most of his career. So I, he, like, had experience communicating and talking professionally um, and had lots of, like, really well-developed, interesting ideas from that time. Mm -hmm. So when he sat down to put it in a novel, uh, I think he, he already had a lot of the skills there. Um, Do you... Oh, my gosh. I think I sold our... Dino mayonnaise. No, I, I have it. Oh, I took thank it. goodness. Yep, and okay. I, I turned it in. Nice. Um, turned it into what? <laughs> into the bundle. Oh. Uh, how, how many words do you need to have a decent-sized novel? Like, is there a threshold between short story and novel? Yeah, um, short stories are usually three to five thousand words. Um, novella is like ten to fifty thousand. I don't remember what's between short story and novella. Um, definitionally, a novel is anything more than fifty thousand words. Okay, that is fictional. Um, but most novels that you would pick up and read are like eighty to a hundred thousand. So, I sat down today and wrote an eight. 8,500 word technical document <laughs> from uh -huh. scratch, um, which is uh, obviously much easier. Stories, friend. <laughs> Here's a short story about how to connect a web client to an API to Excel. <laughs> Enjoy. Oh, I, I would like to know that. <laughs> you really, you really would. Well, I guess maybe it would be useful for you, but. For the rest of you out there, Excel is not the future. Please don't make mm -hmm. things that work or depend on it. That's my advice. UC or like Python or something else to manage your data because it's going to be better in pretty much every way except accessibility. <laughs> Where does the sap go? I'm playing Russian roulette with these chests. Here we um, go. I, I got the green it. or the orange one. It was the green. You were right on your first try. Unlike me. <laughs> Berkeley, is there anything that I forgot from the list of things I wanted to say today? Yeah, you had a movie you wanted to talk about. Oh, Crouching Tiger, yeah. Hidden. Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. So I watched this movie with my wife and... It was explained to me as a great kind of martial arts film. And it is. 
but what I went into the film expecting and what I got were very, very different things. So this movie's been out, I think, since 2000, maybe a little after that. So I'm going to spoil some things, and uh, that's life. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> I guess you can leave if you don't want to hear any spoilers. Wait, no, please don't go. <laughs> um, but it starts out as a story, like almost a, a, a kind of really played down love story between a warrior monk and a woman in 1800s China. And, oh, it's a night market. This is so crazy. I came here by accident, but look at this beautiful market. What the, the, so I thought that that was going to be the main point of the movie and it is a subplot, but there is so much more going on in that film. And there's a lot of, in, in a lot of films, like maybe like rush hour would be a good example where the fighting and the slapstick comedy are kind of the focus of the film. There were martial arts going on in the film and definitely it was a main piece of the film but what I came away with was not how great the martial arts were um, but how unique and kind of thought provoking the ending was so hmm. essentially what ends up happening is it tells this story of a um I don't know, not really nobility as we would think of it, but like this this prov provincial governor's daughter uh, who doesn't want to marry into an arranged marriage, um, doesn't want to be a political figure or have to play the princess role that she's been given in life. Um, you know, just is really seeking freedom from so many different things and I'm doing a bad job of explaining it but in the end she gets what she wants uh, but she also realizes that she can never really have what she wants and uh, I don't want to spoil the ending completely because that would take away some of the power of it but the film ends in such a way that you don't know what happens to her and hmm. and it kind of could be interpreted several different ways and it's it's been a long time since i've seen a movie like that in fact i would say that maybe inception is the closest to that that i've seen where the ending is so contested because it's purposefully ambiguous mm -hmm. oh wow it's it's oh i thought it was 1 a.m and i had to run home we're good <laughs> we, we're good um, but the ending of Inception isn't really that meaningful because there's only one question to ask, which is, is it real or not? Whereas the ending of, of Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon has the more ambiguous and also, you know, unsolvable question of why, um, why does the... Why does the princess do what the princess does? So, uh, if you're interested in a martial arts film that isn't really, or maybe is more than just a martial arts film, I'd recommend giving it a watch. Um, it's a little slow in the beginning, and it, I believe it was made in China, and I think it was filmed in Mandarin. So there's a, there's a dub that you can go... Um, if you own the DVD, which is how I watched it, you can turn on the subtitles and listen to it or, or um, sorry, turn on the dub and listen to it or, or turn on subtitles and read along. Um, but because it wasn't made by Hollywood, it does some things differently than Hollywood typically does. So, uh, you know, the way that they use music and uh, like just the way that they filmed it, the camera angles and distances and stuff. Very interesting, quite different from what I was expecting. So give it a shot if you're curious to know more. Nice. Thanks for the recommendation. 
Um, Scamble wants to know, what's your three-word summary of Crouching Tiger? Ooh. <laughs> this might be considered four words because one of one of my three words is an acronym with two letters, but Green Destiny OP. There you go. Green Destiny OP. Yep. I do not know what any part of that means. So Green Destiny is the name of like this famous sword. It's kind of like a it's like if a five year old came up with a sword and then was like <laughs> This sword is the best sword that ever existed. It can cut uh -huh. through everything. Even your sword, it can cut through the, your sword. And it makes me the best. That's Green, that's green Destiny in the movie. Okay. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> nice. Um... I don't know how similar these movies actually are, but a lot of what you're saying kind of reminded me of everything everywhere, not all at once. Yeah, I would, I would say actually the, the, the mother in that film is one of the leading actors in this one. Oh, really? That's yep. cool. Um, just like the, it kind of a martial arts movie, but so much more than that. And, um, maybe ambiguous in important ways. I think we might have talked about that movie on the stream before. Yeah, I think we, we did. I don't need to go into a full review, but uh, that's a fantastic one. Um, did you already see everything you wanted to at the night market? I didn't even go. I, I oh. decided to fish. I caught a lingcod. Nice. So. That just feels like two syllables that don't mean anything <laughs> smashed together. Got, I have trouble thinking of lingcod as one word. Yeah. But then I split it into two words, and then doesn't help. It doesn't really help, does it? <laughs> Do you remember that Deep Thoughts book that I had? Um, I, up? I don't. This sounds in intriguing, though. <laughs> so it started as an SNL skit, I think, where he would, some comedian would just like write these, uh, these, like pithy. They sounded philosophical words of wisdom, but they were all like very sarcastic and tongue in cheek. Yeah. Um, one of them was that to understand mankind, you had to like split up the word and think about its parts. And the parts of mankind are mank and eind. <laughs> <laughs> what do these words mean? It's a mystery. And that's why so is mankind. That's hilarious. Okay, this guy is giving free coffee. Yes. Um, I heard that in an earlier version of the game, he would give you a cup of coffee every 10 minutes if you kept asking for it. And so people would just, like, come to the night market and just get their, like, uh, an entire like 20, bucket of coffee. 20 coffees and then sell them or give them away as gifts. Um, do you want to go fishing with me? Sure. In the submarine? Try to catch a blobfish? Yeah, okay. Have we caught a blobfish before? I don't know. Let me check my list of things. That's not the list of things. Here it is. We have a sandfish, a flounder. I don't see blobfish on here. I think it's in the bottom middle, if you've caught it. Uh, let me check I have again. not. Yeah, I don't think I have it. Okay. Yeah, let's do it. This is the submarine all the way on the left. Oh, here you are. Okay, I'm going to pay a thousand gold to go deep sea fishing. Maybe we should have brought a farm totem. I think that this is a good use of a farm totem. Maybe we can come back tomorrow. Um, yeah, so he's just, have you done the submarine before? Nope. So he's just going to take us down to the, the very bottom of the ocean, presumably, and uh, we get to fish. Um, while we do that, I want to talk a little bit about phone mindfulness. Mm. Uh, speaking of hippie communes. <laughs> 
So this is something that I'm not super good at, but it's something I'm passionate about and I've thought a lot about and I've found some things that work kind of well. So I just wanted to, to share some advice and maybe some motivation. Um, it's 2023. Most of us have smartphones. Most of us use those smartphones more than we probably wish we did. Um, I think we've all like seen the dangers of social media and like how that can... I, th I think we've talked about on the stream about how like social media can lead to extremism and loneliness and oh I caught a blowfish already nice um and like just can it can be a time waster um I don't want to say that it's all bad but I think that if you're not thinking about the way that you're using your phone it can quickly turn into a problem and have some negative consequences I think that is that fair to say yeah definitely Okay. Yeah, I don't want to sound like I'm all anti-technology because I am I'm, I'm very invested in technology and I use it a lot. But uh, yeah, I think if people aren't careful and aren't thinking about how they're using it, then it can lead to some problems. So, um, just a few tips on like how to pay attention to how you're using your phone. Um, oh, it is midnight. Do you want to quit now or fish a little more? Uh, let's go back. I don't want to okay. risk losing it. So one thing that's helped me a ton is to just have like a screen time tracking app. Um, I think iPhones have this built in now, but I have an Android and I use an app called Action Dash that I really like. Um, so it does a few different things for you. Uh, it tracks throughout the day how much you have used each app, um, both like the total number of minutes and the number of times you've opened it. And I think also the number of notifications it has sent you. Um, so that is helpful just for like over time I've kind of been able to learn like this is what it feels like emotionally when I have spent two hours on social media and one hour playing games on my phone um, and this is what it is, feels like when I play spend four hours playing games on my phone and no hours on social media um, this is so so that's been helpful just like knowing what those different amounts of time feel like yeah um, and then like setting goals, like I can say, I spent 21 hours on my phone this week. I'm going to shoot for 19 next week. Um, I don't always do that. I'm not super strict with it, but when I, I notice it's my social media as you start affecting me emotionally, then I can like set goals and see how I'm doing. Yeah. Um, also throughout the day, if it's like 6 PM and I've already spent two hours on my phone, then I know I should probably set it down for a little while. Um, Anyway, yeah, so Action Dash is cool. Uh, it also lets you, I, I have the paid version, which has been super worth it for me. Um, that also lets you set limits um, and not just total limits for the day, like I think the iPhone does by default, but um, you can say like between 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. I'm supposed to be at work, so I'm only gonna give myself like 30 minutes of screen time during that window. Or like these are the 10 apps that I'm allowed to use uh, during the two hours before bed. Um, or things like that. Like you can be super fine grained with the limits that you set. And then when you try to use your phone beyond those limits, it will like have a little gif of Homer Simpson saying that's enough. So that's fun. <laughs> um, I think that fine grained control is super cool. Um, again, you don't need to be like super draconian about it, but I think when you want to have goals, it's nice to just have a little built in mechanism for that. Yeah. And you know, the scientific process is mess around with stuff to find out what happens and record data and anything you want to change in your life. If you want to do it methodically, you got to follow that process. So it can help to have something like that, or you can have empirical data. Um, so you really know, and you're not gauging just based on, you know, whatever psychological, uh, bias you might have. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If I don't know if that it, it it was connected in my head. I don't know if that makes no, sense. No, yeah, for sure. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I think that's why it's so helpful for me to be like to have the numbers, even if I don't have limits on my phone of like how much I'm allowed to use it. It's nice to just see a little notification at the top of my phone that says you've used it this much today, because then I'm like, I don't just have to go on what I'm feeling. I can like combine what I'm feeling with the the actual numbers feels good um 
So that's like just monitoring and maybe controlling the, the amount of time you're spending on your phone. Uh, outside of that, I think it's it's useful. I don't follow these super rigorously, but at different times in my life, I've like tried to be really diligent about it for a month or two, and I've noticed that it helps. So I don't have the willpower to actually do these things <laughs> consistently, but um, I think every little bit helps and just paying attention to it. So um, trying to not have my phone around when I'm around family members. I'm, I'm not awesome at that, but uh, something I'm trying to get better at. Um, not using the phone in bed, I think is helpful. I it's so easy to like wake up. Um, my eyes are blurry. I don't want to get out of bed yet. So I just scroll through Reddit for like 15 or 20 minutes before I get out of bed. That is very easy to do, mm -hmm. but my days feel so much better when I don't do that. Um, and the same thing with going to bed at night. Uh, when I, when I read a book, instead of looking at my phone, I, I think I sleep better. Uh, I feel bad saying all these things because I know that my wife is going to just be thinking, you actually don't do any of this ever. <laughs> I do do some of it sometimes, and it does feel good. Well, yeah. Um, I mean, every everybody's life is, is made of like either growing or staying the same or declining. And part of growing is um, wanting, even if you can't achieve immediately. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah. It's a process. I think just like knowing what the next steps are is helpful, even even if you're not like getting there consistently. Yeah. So it feels good to try. It feels good to like be aware of the effect of tools in your life so that they can stay tools and not um, anything more than that. Yeah. Okay. That's my soapbox. Pay attention to how you're using your phone. Thanks for sharing. That's a, uh, that's important. You know, it, it's actually been really interesting now that I'm working full time, realizing how much time I wasted, even when I was really busy, how much time I wasted on my phone or on, on my computer. Like I should be working, but I'm not. And now I'm at work. I don't have my own private office. So I'm very much, um, not under scrutiny, but like, I guess it's just easier to stay focused when I know that there's people around me who, mm -hmm. uh, will know <laughs> if I'm not, uh -huh. you know, and that's like, that helps me to kind of key in, um, in a way. So, you know, now that I'm working, it, it makes me realize like my phone battery could last for two, almost two and a half days now. Cause I just don't use it nearly oh, wow. as much as I did before. And part of that's because I used to listen to music or a book constantly, and I don't when I'm at work. Um, George oh, is a I, mean guy. Sometimes. He can be a sweetie, too. Jared, you were watching us. I was. You did a kind thing there, Penny. I was. You should have asked instead of assuming George wanted help. I'm just taking a walk, minding my own business. Why can't I accuse both of them of witchcraft? <laughs> um, what would you answer, Berkeley? You know, you know the right answer. Um, I don't remember. Uh, did you already choose wrong? No. Oh, sorry. I've got the delay. I forgot about the delay when I watch on Twitch. Um, tell me the options again. Uh. You did a kind thing there. You should have asked instead of assuming George wanted help. I was just taking a walk, minding my own business. I think you want the second one. I'm pretty sure this is George's cutscene, not Penny's, and she won't be that upset if you say it. Okay. Oh, I guess you're right. I'm sorry, Mr. Molnar. His last name is Molnar. Now he's crying. Oh. Oh, like and he's apologizing. Oh. Ah, like in a love will thaw frozen heart way. Mm-hmm. Okay, now Penny says it must be difficult to grow old. I'd rather not think about it. It's just a different part of life. That's why we should respect our elders or I'd rather die young. Whoa. Okay, I'm going to go with that's why we should respect our elders. Boom. Got it. 
Nice. She said it was interesting talking to you. I don't know what that means. That's a nicer thing than anyone George's age has ever said to me. Just kidding. <laughs> Brutal. All right. Well, um, how would you feel about cutting the day short a little yeah, bit? Yeah, can do that. Okay. Um, let me just, I've got one more fish. I've got one, one fish on the line. Ah, sturgeon. Are those worth a good amount? They're rare, I think. I hope so. It was very hard to catch. <laughs> Let me get all these uh, eggs fermenting. <laughs> Egg liquor. Never forget. Also, I did look it up. Um, cause I was thinking about eggnog and like, is eggnog egg liquor? I don't know if we talked about this, but the liquor in eggnog, the alcohol in eggnog was added later. Uh, it wasn't made from the egg. Usually it was like wine or beer, I think in the original iteration of eggnog. And I probably use other uh, stuff now. I don't know, but yeah, I, I can't imagine wine tasting good in that. I would, I would have guessed like something with less flavor like vodka but hmm. yeah I mean, there's historical reasons like the different types of alcohol developed in different parts of the world and then maybe eggnog was a very local <laughs> phenomenon there was a show i don't remember what it was called but it was on netflix back in like 2013 2014 and they went around making old recipes i think it was in england but i think they did some other regions as well and what i learned from that is that the majority of food was not good until <laughs> global trade expanded and forgive me for making light of colonialism but i gotta say i do understand the drive to not be eating disgusting food anymore to fuel the spice trade yeah and yeah I mean, colonialism was ugly and Columbus did a lot of bad things, but I mean, it wasn't just like good foods coming to Europe. It was all over the world. Things were going yeah. to new places. Yeah. I think we're all, uh, cuisine wise, I think we're all better off than we were in 1500. I agree. All right. Um, yeah, let's call it there. Thanks everyone for joining us. Um, this is a fun one. We're, we're making incremental progress here. <laughs> We're in a bit of a plateau, it feels like, but um, we're still making more money, we're working our way towards spring when we can get all those pigs and making friends. So, and if you yeah. want to have a secret little laugh every time you hear the word pigs, go watch uh, an Irish movie that I just blanked out on. What is it called? It's It's got a heist, it's got uh a lottery scene but Barmer, you know the one i'm talking about jared i do not believe you i don't think there's ever been an irish heist movie <laughs> okay waking the divine oh it's legendary it's a legendary film and it will make you laugh about pigs okay my parents love that movie so i've spent a lot of time looking at the back of the vhs box <laughs> i did not realize it was irish or a heist movie oh yeah it's not fully it's not fully fully heist but there is a big a big part of it is the heist so yeah thank you scandal and babarma for uh for that <laughs> all right well follow us on instagram youtube and twitch all those are in our um link tree which you can find if you try hard i, I believe in you <laughs> and we will see you next time thanks everyone bye bye